Recently, I've been on a tour of past horror games, mostly because I missed out on quite a few heavy hitters that arguably had a massive influence on the horror games I enjoy playing so much today. So when it came to finally playing Silent Hill 2, I was a little concerned. I'd been putting off Silent Hill 2 for a variety of reasons. The first being purely logistical. Trying to experience Silent Hill 2 as it was when it was first released in 2001 is difficult to achieve these days without a cash injection, so the next best thing was running it on emulation. Or, if you don't want that hassle, there is always the absolutely horrific remaster, which comedically, is the most readily available version. In addition to this, I was also worried that it would not live up to its reputation that it had gotten over the last 20 years as one of, if not the, scariest video games of all time. No other horror game franchise is held in such high regard or revered as much as Silent Hill. The only one that comes relatively close to it is Resident Evil. Which is funny when you think that before 2024, the last Silent Hill game released in 2014, whilst Resident Evil has had consistent releases every other year or so. That being said, I finally took the plunge and booted up Silent Hill 2. As I moved cautiously through the dense fog encasing the town, I delved into the tight and winding hallways of its dilapidated buildings, fighting escaping and surviving all the horrors that inhabited this dark place. All the while, I was fearing and questioning every noise, every split-second glimpse of an inhuman shape through the near-pitch black darkness and the thick fog. All of this contributing to this inescapable feeling that I was being observed. And then, a funny thought hit me. This game which was made well over 20 years ago, with technology that has been outdated for quite a while, has actually aged extremely well. Now, let's start with the beginning. We start with James Sunderland, staring into his reflection from a rundown restroom on the outskirts of the town of Silent Hill, after apparently receiving a letter from his wife, Mary. The letter states that she's in Silent Hill, waiting for him in their special place, the issue being that Mary has been dead for the last three years. One of the first aspects that pulls you into the world of Silent Hill 2 is just how effectively it deploys sound. The game begins with that now iconic opening shot, and with a score beautifully crafted by Akira Yamoka accompanying it, you are immediately immersed into a mind-bending reality where dream logic rules. Audio is used quite sparingly. At most points, the only thing you'll hear for minutes on end is James's footsteps, as well as the ambient echoes of the ruins of this old town. Then, in stark contrast with cutscenes and boss fights, sound kicks it up a notch in such a way that it builds an almost immeasurable amount of suspense that threatens to give way to outright panic. All the while, using beats from a soundtrack that, whether they knew it in 2001 or not, would become one of the most iconic soundtracks of all time. I feel it is safe to say that Silent Hill 2 has one of the most effective methods of using audio to convey horror I have ever seen in a game, which is hilarious to think for a game that came out over 20 years ago. I'm trying to think of a game that surpassed it, or is at least on the level of it, and the only ones I can think of are, coincidentally, PT, and also Alien Isolation, and Alan Wake 2. A big part of the gameplay loop of Silent Hill 2 is in its exploration and puzzle solving. Exploring, in a nutshell, takes the form of trying every single door you can find, searching and clearing every single room until you encounter that point where the purpose of an item you found 30 minutes ago all of a sudden becomes clear. This may sound incredibly boring, and perhaps a little repetitive, but I can assure you, it never, ever feels that way. Instead, there is a constant feeling of dread, carried by a perfect mix of visuals, atmosphere, and its enemies, all culminating in a permanent fear of what is coming next. The best example of this is right at the start, with the walk from the car park to the graveyard going on for just a bit too long, so that winding path, the fog, 
and the almost unbearable noises coming through it create a feeling of isolation that just creeps up on you as the player. A feeling of there is no turning back now. Now, regarding how Silent Hill 2 handles its puzzles, I'm going to simply say that at many points in the game, a solution to a puzzle would have had me absolutely stumped, walking around and backtracking for what felt like hours just to see if James's head would gravitate towards something in a room I may have missed the first time around. I found that the puzzles actually get easier and easier when you start actively thinking outside of the box. Earlier, I mentioned the concept of dream logic. This is an almost nonsensical logic you possess while dreaming that seems to make perfect sense until you wake up. Almost the entire game operates on this, a nightmare spiralling further and further out of control until the world around us no longer makes any sense, with hallways and doors seemingly leading straight up, down, or to entirely different areas of a building. The rule soon becomes clear that if you can pick it up, it is important somewhere. I think the funniest example of this kind of logic coming together came with the horseshoe door handle. This is a particular puzzle where you find a lighter, a candle, and a horseshoe, and use these ingredients to fashion a makeshift door handle to open a hatch. If this puzzle was present earlier in the game, I probably would have had no clue what to do. If I'm being honest, I actually didn't know combining items was a thing until way later than I should have. The game doesn't tutorialize this, or any other mechanic for that matter. It goes off the assumption that you'll actually find it yourself. I thought that prior experience with uh, games such as Resident Evil might help me here, but it soon became clear that Silent Hill approaches its puzzles with a certain degree of difficulty that, in my opinion, Resident Evil simply does not. And, all in all, yeah, this one's probably on me. I don't really read things. The good news is that this was a habit that quickly left me from this point onwards. When I see how Silent Hill 2 approaches both its exploration and its puzzle elements in the modern day context, I feel like it represents how games design philosophy has changed over the last 20 years. It was really interesting to see what stuck and what changed. Let's talk about the combat in Silent Hill 2. It's not the greatest thing in the world. If anything, it's pretty clunky most of the time. It is a fairly simple formula of locking onto a target and mashing the X button until that target stops moving. While simple in nature, I found that it was still enjoyable and at points did feel quite challenging. However, most of this challenge came from the camera itself and attempting to get it to cooperate before I was either stabbed, impaled, strangled, or even swarmed by bats. Before the days of over-the-shoulder third person being the horror norm, many big hits worked with fixed cameras. Silent Hill 2 works with a mix of fixed point cameras and an orbiting third person view, which in its defense works fairly well everywhere else except in combat. I soon realized that I didn't actually need to see what I was looking at to shoot it, knowing that I was hitting it off screen through sound alone, which felt a bit naff. I also didn't mind the combat loop being simplistic, as I felt it lent itself to the overall narrative. Our protagonist, James Sunderland, is a 29 year old who works a job as a clerk. He is the embodiment of the average man. He's not going to be a hyper-capable agent like the protagonists of many other horror games. He's going to be frightened, confused, and, as it turns out, an absolute menace with a 2x4. He'll use absolutely anything he can get his hands on in order to fight back. All in all, I won't dock points for combat too much, as I am viewing it from the lens of playing games that have done horror game combat so much better since then, so I will just say that the combat of Silent Hill 2 can very much be summarised as a product of the time period in which it was made. Now on to arguably the main event, the story. The story of Silent Hill 2 is genuinely one of the best, but also the most heartbreaking I've ever experienced. It aims to explore deep within the mind of James Sunderland through themes of loss, guilt, and also sexual desire. With all this, 
it acts not only as a psychological horror, but also as a haunting, doomed love story, with James searching for his long-thought deceased wife, who, according to the letter he received, is somewhere in the town. In reality, this all hides a deeper, darker context that is still centred on love, but not in the way we initially suspected. It soon revealed that James killed Mary, who had been sick with an unknown terminal disease, and that she hadn't died three years ago. She actually died days ago. But by the time we see James in that bathroom right at the start of the game, his psyche has already suppressed that memory, and instead created a scenario where she is in Silent Hill, waiting for him. With all these emotions emerging from the depths of James's shattering psyche, the town greets him with the physical manifestations of all those emotions, in the form of grotesque monsters, such as the iconic Pyramid Head, who is established as a manifestation of James Sunderland's guilt and desire for punishment. But other manifestations, however, are more human, such as Maria, who bears a striking resemblance to James's late wife Mary, but acts more flirtatious and dresses in a more revealing way than the more 50s housewife fit we usually see Mary in. It's clear Maria is the physical embodiment of the version of Mary that James deep down really wanted. So much so, one of the multiple game endings sees James fully succumb to this delusion and stay with Maria. As well as Maria, along the way, James encounters other characters in the town of Silent Hill. We have Angela, a 19-year-old survivor of child abuse as they search for their mother. The other character is Eddie, a boy tormented by his peers, prompting him to take action by killing his bully's dog and shooting one of them in the leg, and then running away to Silent Hill. As they both succumb to the madness of this town, their stories both, unfortunately, end in death with Angela seeing no way to escape the torment of her past, ascending a flaming staircase, and Eddie, now fully psychotic, is put down in self-defense by James himself. It's never established if these were real people or simply parts of James's psyche. It's left purposefully ambiguous, and fans have been debating their significance for the last two decades. But I'd be willing to assume that they represent different parts of James's psyche, Angela being his hope, and Eddie being more like a representation of James's repressed feelings of inadequacy. The performances by some characters can, at times, be questionable, with some pretty hilarious line reads, but at the same time, they all have a certain dreamlike quality to them that just blends in effortlessly with everything else. This is also captured during cutscenes, where people move and talk in such a way that it feels creepy. And that's because all the mouth and facial movements were all handmade, which explains the level of uncanniness. But again, it all lends itself to this quality of a dreamlike narrative all the more. Both the story and the characters within it have so much depth that people are still talking about them to this day, still theorising about what their true purpose was, and what was real and what was not. And I think that is the best part about Silent Hill 2's story. It doesn't feel the need to explain itself. I feel like it operates on the concept that nightmares don't need to be fully understood by a dreamer to still feel terrifying. And I believe that that is the type of horror that they were making here, a fear of the unknown. What you cannot see, what you cannot understand or reason with, scares you even more. To conclude, Silent Hill 2, for lack of a better word, is special. It is a game that has defined a genre for generations, and is still inspiring developers, like myself, to this day. I'm sad that it's not more readily available outside the awful HD collection version from 2012, as I believe it is an essential playing for any fan of horror. It is not flawless, and some parts of it have not aged well, but it is still one of the best horror games of all time. Its story, its visual design, and its sound design all culminate into a genuine work of art. 
With the remake in sight, I am cautiously optimistic that they can capture at least some of what made the original Silent Hill 2 great. In my opinion, what I've seen so far looks quite promising. Some of the changes are a little odd in my opinion, such as the updated Maria model, but we will have to see where it goes. And if it goes wrong, it will be a shame, but the original will still be there, waiting for us in our special place. PSX emulators. And that is the review of Silent Hill 2. I've been wanting to do this review for quite a while, but I had other games that I'd completed and done. So yeah, I did them first. It's almost revitalized my spirit in many ways for reviewing, typing, scripting, editing. It's just, it's one that's made me go, oh yeah, I'm excited to do this. But yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Let me know uh, what you think in the comments below. And if you've played Silent Hill 2, let me know. Also, just out of curiosity, let me know which thumbnail you got. Uh, because I, I'm running that test now and I uh, thought I might as well make a little mini game of it. Comment um, which one you got. Yeah, let's drive that engagement. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Bye now.